Look, the career, um, I make it rather short, but precise. Um, I'm born and raised in Switzerland. My mother is Swiss. My late father, as you mentioned, was Hussein Najadi, who unfortunately got um, assassinated um, in, uh, in Malaysia in uh, July 2013. Um, a big tragedy for us. Um, I refocused my um, center of life back to Switzerland. I've been away from Switzerland since 1992. Um, after schooling, I went to the military. Um, my, I have some uh, very Swiss DNA in my blood from my mother's side, of course. Uh, her grand uncle was um, Rudolf Minger, who was president of Switzerland during the Second World War, good friend of Charles de Gaulle. And um, yeah, that was the toughest time for our country in the history of Switzerland, in the modern history. Um, <clears throat> go back to that army. Then I started at the internship at UBS. UBS is still around. Um, we come to that later. Um, that was in 1987. And um, I moved to London first, well, helped building up Merrill Lynch uh, Capital Markets in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and in 92, I moved to London, Great Britain, and was a vice president at Merrill Lynch in London and New York, advising governments um, on ministerial level from the Baltics down to Croatia which at that time was in a defense at war. what age did you reach that? Uh, uh, I was 25. Very impressive indeed. At 20... I, I didn't study. I, I didn't study. I don't have the Swiss Matura. I have a diploma in economics in high school. Uh, that's about it. This is it. also a typical of uh, highly gifted people. Some of them don't study and they make Look, they themselves. I had a long discussion about this with Robert Breedlove, who also talked about Bitcoin. Uh, Robert Breedlove is quite well known. Go to YouTube and find him. You find my interviews. There were two interviews each, I believe, two hours or longer. Um, look, today it's more difficult than 40 years ago or 30 years ago. Why? Today we have this Bologna system which in my view is a total failure. We went away from national diploma to the Bologna credits uh, system. Then we have this buzzword MBA. I always told people in London and New York, it's management by walking around. It's literally a mass product and every university around the globe in some corner offers you online even an MBA. It means nothing to me. I'm very sorry. Um, whether that be Harvard, Stanford, or a second or third year country um, MBA. What is important is what can you do for the company, like what can you do for the government, for not for the government, for the country or for the people, uh, for your family. Same rules apply. This is a bit of a discipline you learn in the military. In Switzerland, it's a good thing. I mean, I know other countries, the army maybe is not a good thing to go to. It's maybe a bit more difficult. But in the Swiss military at that time, we had discipline. Today, it's all a bit different, a bit more modern, a bit more woke, which is completely crazy. Um, but getting the job done was the culture early on. And I, I must say the Americans... Um, Merrill Lynch at that time was the number one investment bank for seven years in a row, both in debt and equity, league tables, number one. Um, better than Goldman Sachs, better than JP Morgan. They hated us. <laughs> we were like Trump in the field, you know. We just rolled on and we delivered. And what we learned at Merrill Lynch in the early 90s, that was the spirit in the firm, don't be afraid making mistakes. That doesn't mean you should be encouraged to make them. But if you make them, learn from them, don't make them a second time. Okay. And 
that got me, I was multicultural because I grew up also in Singapore when I was a kid with my dad in Bahrain, in the Gulf, in Hong Kong, in London a bit, and of course Geneva and Switzerland, Lucerne, um, made me multicultural and I like to communicate with other cultures and learn the nuances of their elites and their um, systems, be that political or economic. And so I analyze a lot. And, you know, there's also another component. You've got to focus on which on information you need. Um, you cannot know everything. and No one can. So I think one has to be on the move, on the go, ready to be able to assess a crisis, a problem, and to define a solution fast, efficient, and if possible, on one page not on a PowerPoint with 50 pages, because no president, no minister has time or the, or, or the capacity to read through in a crisis, um, to read through 50 pages of PowerPoint and then still have to have the same questions like before. It should be problem, three solutions or three steps towards the solution and in the back, if necessary, options one, two, three, and then you can decide. So, and then comes the pitch book, and then comes the, the nitty gritty of the chosen solution to fight the crisis, whatever it is. Um, if it's not ready made already, of course, if it's military, then you have the military, it's easy. Um, the, that was the, the, the drive I could do, and it was the time, don't forget, it was Berlin, the uh, East Berlin, the wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed, disintegrated, and all the money from the West is like water flowed immediately to the immediate countries east of West Berlin. That was the Baltics, down to Croatia, Yugoslavia, unfortunately Serbia at that time, um, under Milosevic, performed, did, aggression war against Croatia and um, I then got involved in stabilizing the Republic of Croatia shortly after the war in 95 after the peace agreement until 2000. Um, then of course the capital went further as Central Europe got stabilized in the mid 90s the hunger for more yield and for more spread and margins also in production salaries were lower still further east but technology was growing fast and you could implement modern factories. Like, you know, in the 90s, Audi operated the V8 aluminum engine production in Hungary. And that quality of those engines, I was told by Audi then, was better than the engines produced previously in Germany. So, um, you know, industrialists, they spotted that and went east. Russia had a big go, um, then collapsed in 98 under Yeltsin because he was not very focused on the job. He was a good man. He was not corrupt, but he had a few problems and health problems. And the privatizations came in Russia. It was a disaster. Oligarchs um, popped up. People who had no money before all of a sudden became billionaires because they were cheating, stealing the people's vouchers for the privatization for a bottle of vodka, literally. Um, and so that phase went on. And in 98, things blew up in, I mean, financially in Moscow. And then of course, there was a big shockwave backwards away from it. And then Putin came and then confidence came back and Russia started to continue. And with that, we had Central Euro, uh, Central Asia coming up because people don't know, many people don't know where Kazakhstan is. But Kazakhstan is five times the size of France, has only 18 million people, and is the fifth largest oil and gas reserve in the world, plus uranium, plus gold, plus all the metals, and what have you. Then you have Azerbaijan. Again, people don't realize where it is. Go and look at Baku today, very modern town. Um, Azerbaijan, on the other side of the Caspian, opposite of Kazakhstan, oil and gas. Um, what did they do? They modernized 
quickly. They did not put land telephone lines into their cities anymore. Why should they? They went straight to mobile. Um, they went straight to wireless and all these things that we have that we went from copper cables down to the Wi-Fi, internet through the copper cables, then internet through the fiber optics. If and I now we have what you have said so far is that at individual level for your own growth and also at actual yeah. country level or whatever company level it is, being fast in recognizing problem and acting fast is the key for success. I think so. And but for that you need a good boss. I was lucky. I had, you know, my bosses uh, were, um, they had the spectrum, and they gave me the freedom to operate. And they had the courage as much as I needed courage to do it. Um, I can say that I never have made a dog in our business. It's a dog meaning a, a deal that really goes south, which blows up into the face of investors. I didn't do that. Never. Thank God. Um, but, you know, it, it, you need a bit of luck, of course. Again, who's your boss? Is this person willing to give you room to develop? Or is the person jealous because you're going up too quick? Okay. It takes size of mind and character. And a good boss, a strong boss, will let you operate because if you operate well you bring more revenue for the firm or for the bank or for the company okay what so what was your position uh, at that stage actually uh -huh. what was your position official position i was a vice president of merrill lynch international new york and london but then uh Klein bob benson the oldest british um merchant bank Klein bob benson limited um and poached me from Merrill Lynch and offered me the um, the management board decision as a director of the on, on the board of Clambo Benson in London. And that was then 29. That was April 97. Um, then Dresdner Bank, the second largest bank of Germany at that time, bought Clambo Benson and made Clambo Benson the global investment bank for the Dresdner Bank Group worldwide. So we got more capital, we had more um, books to uh, uh, write um, risk on to and operate. And um, it, was, it was very, very well done because we had the expertise of the classical, you know, Anglo-Saxon merchant banking techniques which is Anglo-Saxon business. Investment banking is not Germany, it's not Switzerland, it's not France. It's it's an Anglo-Saxon thing, um, whether you like it or not. But that's in, in terms of history, that's where it comes from. And so that was quite good. The advisory business was very important, M&A, et cetera. Privatizations were important. So they gave me more territory. As a board member, I could decide what I wanted to do. So I said, I want Russia. I wanted, of course, Central Asia, the Middle East, from uh, from Egypt down to Oman, ex-Iran, because of certain sanctions, it was just not possible, um, no Saudi Arabia, but uh, the African continent from North Africa down to Andalus. I kept my baby Central Europe because I just liked it. Uh, it's been a long, long history I had with it at the time. Um, uh, going forward. So I, I became British citizen because I paid taxes there for 10 years um, and um, uh, through naturalization. Um, I'm still Swiss, of course, so I am Swiss. And um, then came this dot-com bubble, which you might remember, where everything with a dot-com was going through the roof positively. And there was no real business on the line. So we had like an inflation. If you have a system and you pump in money into a system, but productivity does not increase, does not increase, then you get inflation. That was the first shock. And that went very bad. And I think in my personal view, 2002 and three were the last years where investment banking made sense. Since then, until today, 
the industry has suffered, is falling apart, is blowing up, literally, financially, I mean, um, and is a difficult business to operate in. Compliance has, you know, steepened. There's more compliance officers than there is advisors in the bank. It cannot be like that. Um, so I think the historic capsule of investment banking heydays from the 1960s until 2002, that was a good time to be in. And now banking has changed. I resigned from the bank. I left the bank in 2004, um, advised um, um, President Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan uh, for two years. Then I became the senior, uh, what do you call that, uh, the chief representative of Bombardier Aerospace, a Canadian aerospace company, uh, to the Socialist Republic of Vietnam in Hanoi. Then, then finally joined my father's company in Malaysia, the Merchant Finance House, until unfortunately he got brutally assassinated. Since then, I am no longer in business at all. So you did a full journey from many countries in Europe, Central Europe, yeah. Central Asia, Africa, and you made a lot of impact in all these areas. And at the end, you moved out of a banking system because you felt that it is not efficient or it is corrupt or both. It's both or three things. You have an inflation of egos which doesn't help the business. You have inefficiency through that in the teams. You have corruption through the bonus culture. Completely wrong. How can a bank pay a bonus to its staff or senior management when the bank wrote a loss in that year or went bust like Credit Suisse did? Um, for me, when there was a bad year, I canceled the bonuses. Very simple. And said, sorry, guys, finish. We, we have to start new again. <laughs> um, it's not fair to the shareholders. How can you pay bonuses to senior management when the shareholder sees the stock going down? Plus, the admin staff who has worked very hard, they are not the decision takers, um, are suffering under the mismanagement of senior management. And they get bonuses? No, cannot be. Uh, the same goes for government. You know, if government is mismanaged and if inflation grows because of unproductivity, which we have now, right, then I think one should just resign or through wrong policies created overspending in hundreds of billions of Swiss francs like our COVID policy cost us 330 billion Swiss francs. I don't know where they want to print that money. And look at Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse has been overnight rescued. It's not true. It hasn't been rescued. It is a ongoing problem because the equity of Credit Suisse is or and about 40 billion Swiss francs. Uh, you think you agree with me? Um, however, the unresolved, the unresolved um, liability um, contracts and exposure to structured finance for Credit Suisse with her name worldwide intertwined is $14 trillion. That is almost, I repeat, almost half of the US national debt 